Germany has an amazingly rich prehistoric heritage. Hidden beneath the ground, the rocks of this wonderful country are brimming with paleontological treasures, from giant sea monsters to some of the earliest stages of bird evolution. Well, the Boneheads crew and I were lucky enough to visit Germany on a university field trip last year, where we got to explore several of its spectacular fossil producing localities, and to look around many of the stunning museums that can be found here. So join us in part 2 of our German adventures as we get to fossil hunt in a Solnhofen limestone quarry, then visit a museum filled with astonishing Jurassic Solnhofen fossils of dinosaurs, pterosaurs and fish, and then as we travel onwards to the spectacular Dinosauria Museum Altmutal, where we meet a baby Allosaurus, gigantic Ashdarkid pterosaurs, and even get to come face to face with a T-Rex. Wow, so this is a once a lifetime opportunity to get right up to a skull of a Tyrannosaur. Finally, we also get to go behind the scenes at the incredible Stuttgart Natural History Museum, and walk amongst rows and rows of unbelievable marine reptile fossils. It was a truly awesome field trip and a great experience for all of us, and I hope you enjoy coming along too. After having been able to dig through a section of the world famous Messel Pit, where an entire 47 million year old ecosystem is preserved, and after fossil hunting in a quarry exposing the Posidonia Shale which was once roamed by giant marine reptiles, we were now being let loose in a quarry where the Jurassic aged 150 million year old Solnhofen limestone can be accessed, famous for being the geological formation in which Archaeopteryx was discovered a species that played a key role in unravelling the evolutionary relationships between birds and dinosaurs. Okay, so today we're in a very exciting location. We are here uh, near the town of Solnhofen, which you may know, uh, famously the Solnhofen limestone that you can see surrounding us here in this quarry, is where Archaeopteryx, the dino bird as they call it, yeah, Archaeopteryx lithographica, this is the, the rocks where it was found. So this is a, a late Jurassic aged uh, formation, Tithonian. specifically, yeah, Tithonian. So uh, kind of similar sort of age to Kimmeridge clay formation over in the UK. Uh, but this represents a uh, lagoonal deposit. The reason that things are so exceptionally well preserved here is because the lower levels of this lagoon were quite anoxic, it's very stratified. So the, the water didn't really mix very much. And so the lower levels didn't have any oxygen. Uh, no scavenging, and so you get this exceptional preservation of Archaeopteryx, uh, quite a diversity of different pterosaurs. So yeah, very easy to split. You just get the chisel, whack it down the, down the edges, and it splits really easily into these nice sheets of limestone. So let's get on with that. That pile there. That does look like a good pile. There, that, that hole there. <laughs> Good one to start on. I've got my glasses, it's fine. I can't see with mine on, I'm more of a hazard with them on. <laughs> this is really easy to split, actually. Okay, I say that. Now, oh, there we go. Just kind of doing a practice round here, getting used to how it splits. It is. That is not splitting nicely. Oh, look at that That was nice. <laughs> easy peasy lemon squeezy, what did I say? Although the Solnhofen formation is probably most famous for producing Archaeopteryx, dinosaurs are actually not particularly common here, with just two or possibly three different taxa recognised from here so far. Pterosaurs, on the other hand, are remarkably diverse, with many different species having been discovered that would have once soared above the skies of the lagoon and fed from its waters, even including suspension feeding pterosaurs that filtered out food through a net of many needle-like teeth. Ammonites and many different types of fishes are also very abundant here, and so we were far more likely to find these instead of an Archaeopteryx of our own. Here you're the first find of the day. Charlie just found this really nice ammonite. You got the part and the counterpart. That's so nice though. You're gonna try and cut it down and keep that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I can try. I don't know if you trust me. Okay, so we've been hunting now for what, like an hour or so. Had some pretty good luck. Found a couple of nice fish, which I'll show footage of. Um, and quite a lot of ammonites. They're, uh, they're not too rare here. 
you know? And I mean, yeah, there's, there's definitely a difference in how easily splittable some of these uh, layers are. So like, this one's not as easy to split, like the, the whiter stuff, but we are finding quite a lot of ammonites in there. And apparently, I think this is fresher, so probably better to have a whack at. You've got to kind of look for where there's lines in the sides and then just give it a go, see what happens. No, there's huge fragments coming off of this. There you go, that came off nicely. Oh, and there's an ammonite in there. Oh, that's cool. That's a different kind of preservation tool I've been seeing so far. I don't know if this will pick up right in there. Uh, there is like a little calcified ammonite. I'll probably keep that one, it's pretty cute. Um, counterpart there. Uh, this is where we've been excavating in this little quarry. Now. It is. Yeah. Not the best conditions. Not okay so far. Yeah, so what have you found? You found some really nice ammonites. Yeah, I've got three. So this is the first one I found. Uh, it's starting to rain, but you can see it's all there. Yeah. Whole thing. That's very nice. And, then, and these ones are amazing. This is my favourite one. So you've even got like bits of calcite in there. Not original, yeah. but it's very nice. I don't know if I could cut that down a bit more, but I did a pretty yeah, good job. Yeah, The block was like bigger than me. <laughs> That one's super nice. Yeah. I like the, the red tint to it. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And and then, happy birthday, Fern. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, oh, got I've got a bunch fish. of That's things cool. here. Yeah, I'm happy with my fish. Oh, They're packed away one. in there. Yeah, I was, I thought I'd keep that one. It's quite nice. Bunch of others. Uh, I've packed the fish away, but He's I can get them out. Away. But there, oh, there's one of them. So you can see the tail there. And this little scales. We thought they were just like crystals first, but you can definitely see all the texture. It's really nice. So that's one uh, Charlie found. And then the other one wrapped up in here. Uh, this is the one I just randomly found on top of a spoil heap. Oh, it's falling apart a little bit. It's just the rock. Yeah, there it is. So it doesn't look like much, but you can see some scales in there. Um, I don't know how. <laughs> to prep this. I'm not that experienced with prepping, but I'll uh, see what it's like. So after a pretty successful couple of hours spent digging about in the quarry, it was time to head onwards to the incredible Burgermeister Müller Museum in the town of Sonhofen itself to see some of the spectacular discoveries that have come from this formation and others that are exposed in the region. This museum of course had some amazing fossils of Archaeopteryx on display, including Archaeopteryx No. 7, which was on loan from Munich. Known as the Munich specimen, it's actually one of the youngest specimens of this animal, coming from quite high up in the rock sequences where they've been found, and preserves most of the skeleton still in articulation, plus a partial skull preserving the back part of it you can also see some of the feather impressions in the limestone. This particular specimen actually formed the basis of a new species named in 1993, Archaeopteryx bavarica. However, there's still a lot of debate over the number of species that there might actually be, and since the 90s this specimen has been reclassified as belonging to the original type species Archaeopteryx lithographica. Archaeopteryx has historically been one of the most important fossil discoveries in working out the evolutionary history of birds, and indeed provided the first fossil link between the extinct non-bird dinosaurs and our living feathery friends. So it was an incredible experience to see these fossils here. Archaeopteryx number seven. So not only do they have number seven of Archaeopteryx, they've also got number nine here, which looks like just a bit of forelimb. You can kind of see some feather impressions in that one. But yeah, two of the Archaeopteryx specimens in this museum. Right next to Darwinius. There's Darwinius, either the counterpart, not the part, but it is the, the actual specimen. Original, it says. Darwinius is of course not from the Solnhofen limestone, but from the much younger 47 million year old Messel pit, which there was also an exhibition about in the museum, and which we talked about more in the last episode. I'm also intending to make a whole video about Darwinius and the dangers of overhyping fossil finds in the media at some point soon, as you may remember this controversial fossil was the subject of a documentary that claimed this was the so-called missing link between more basal and higher primates. 
but that's a discussion for another time. Now, I had said that there were two Archaeopteryx specimens in the museum, but technically there was also a third, though it was labelled as the species Wellenhoferia grandis, a name given to it in 2001 when it was considered to be a new species. However, since then there has been more disagreement and it's again been reclassified as Archaeopteryx lithographica. So this would be specimen number 6, and it's also the largest known specimen. Of course, I was very excited to look at the magnificent ichthyosaur fossils in the museum, some of which even preserve their soft tissues. Yes, yeah, so Solnhofen actually represents a lagoonal environment, and ichthyosaurs, generally in the Jurassic at least, they were very you know, open ocean adapted animals. And that could explain also why they are particularly rare in this formation, um, and why we only have these few specimens of these uh, marine reptiles. So I think this is now considered to be Idrosaurus, and it has a lot of soft tissue preservation around it. It says it's Macropterygius there, but that's a species that was named from the Cambridge Clay Formation and is now not considered valid anymore. This is a very, an absolutely stunning specimen. So you can't see the bones that well, but you have all of the, the tissues over them. You can see some traces of ribs in there. And then, yeah, the, the caudal fin is quite stunning. So it's not useful for working out the osteology, the bone anatomy, but soft tissue it is brilliant. And this is also important because usually the uh, exceptional preserved soft, soft tissue ichthyosaurs are early Jurassic in age, but this is much later Jurassic. So it's one of the only ophthalmosaurids that has soft tissue preserved. In fact, a paper from 2022 recently described a couple of Solnhofen ichthyosaurs with soft tissue preservation and found that the remains of skin, connective tissue and possibly even blubber were present in these specimens, providing some amazing insight into the life appearance of these animals. The museum also housed another amazingly complete ichthyosaur, as well as something that appeared to be posing as an ichthyosaur. Ah, thank you. Have you seen? This is the... Um... This is, this is the specimen that they've got wrong. Oh, you know what, I did the same thing, because it, yeah, so, gonna... it looks so much like an ichthyosaur at first. Yeah, so this is, this you is look the measuring kit. Yeah, you look at the tail and it's like, oh. This is what they've noticed. The look at the chevrons. Yeah, oh they're, wow. They're like leaves. Yeah, Yeah. just the skull does look I'm very ichthyosaur Do they have, is it like the cartilage be, bit or something? Yeah, so uh, that, it must be that bit where it sort of changes texture and colour. Yeah. At the end, it's also here on that one. So they've dropped their tails and then grown them yeah. back. So I guess it shows that that um, feature was kind of already evolved by then in the Jurassic. Yeah, that's really, really cool. cool. Yeah. And they can really, oh, I guess it's, yeah, it's very different growth. So you probably can't tell from fossils, but that's really awesome. The museum was also packed with many beautiful specimens of fish, including one in particular that I had very much been looking forward to seeing. Here we've got one of the most incredible bits of preserved behavior in the fossil record probably ever, I have a fish, is it Aspidorhynchus? Aspidorhynchus, yes. Impaling a pterosaur, um, Ramphorhynchus. I mean, well, pro possibly not impaling it, but it definitely seems to have got stuck, probably in its wing membrane. Well, most likely from scavenging the body of this pterosaur. And then obviously it's been taken down into the anoxic levels of the Solnhofen Lagoon. And they've <laughs> become interlocked and preserved together. The chances of this happening is just ridiculously low. And everything is preserved. Another of the most spectacular fossils on display in the museum didn't come from the Solnhofen limestone itself, but rather from the slightly older Torlit formation that's also exposed in the region, and is an absolutely mind-blowing complete skeleton of a dinosaur called Skuromimus. We got Skuromimus here. It means squirrel mimic because it has a really long tail. They think it might have been bushy, like a squirrel. It's such a stunning specimen. Look at the detail. <laughs> yeah, it's even got the hyoids there, which are the bones that anchor the tongue muscles. Wow. The Skuromimus fossil is of a very young juvenile individual, and the classification of this dinosaur has been rather contentious since it was named in 2012 with many studies disagreeing over which theropod group it may belong to. Filamentous structures preserved at the base of the tail and in several other patches across the body also suggest that this juvenile was covered in a feathery coat, which would have helped to keep its small body insulated. 
So the Burgermeister Müller Museum was a wonderful place, and we thoroughly enjoyed our visit there. The Solnhofen limestone is an absolute treasure trove of paleontological discoveries, and we felt very lucky to have had the chance to look for our own fossils in these rocks. The next day, it was off to visit another of Germany's incredible natural history museums, this time the Dinosauria Museum Altmuthal. This quite recently built museum was absolutely spectacular, with several buildings housing some incredible fossils and casts, as well as an outdoor walk through the woods with various models of prehistoric animals, which was great fun, and also a particularly good gift shop. The first thing we went to see here though, was another Archaeopteryx specimen, the 12th specimen out of 13 that we know about. We were doing pretty well on Archaeopteryx fossils on this trip, having seen number 11 in the Senckenberg Museum which we showed in the last episode, number 6, 7 and 9 at Solnhofen, and now 12. The 12th Archaeopteryx is a particularly impressive specimen, being the geologically oldest of all of them and preserving the entire skeleton in perfect articulation. It looks like it could be a modern bird skeleton that's just been flattened a bit, only with teeth and a really long bony tail. It was an amazing fossil to witness for ourselves. After being treated to some Archaeopteryx, we then headed out into the rain, with complimentary umbrellas from the museum, to see what sort of prehistoric animals we could spot. That's so cool. Going into the dinosaur park, where could they be? Hiding in trees. There's an Archaeopteryx. No, it was a pigeon. Never mind. They shrunk the dunk again. He's even smaller. So small. Poor guy. It, it, the lake will eventually fill up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll be alright. He's, he's just a bit beached for now. Yeah. Stranded. Should we go and, we should probably like go and splash water on him to save him. Yeah. Like a whale. Yeah. <laughs> Push him back in, don't let him come out of the soup. I, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Please go back. Is that going to be, what, well, Ichthyostegger, do you think? Acanthostegger? One of the steggers. Yeah. Stegosaurus. He's definitely poisonous. Oh yeah, you can tell the colours. Oh, that's nice. Hold, hold his own. Ichthyostegger. And then you've got Crested Giraffe there, and we all know oh, nice. that Oh, nice. Oh yeah, yeah. A lot flatter now. Yeah. Someone squished well, him. That's how it should be. Oh yeah, because that one's not very flat there, is it? Yeah. So it should be. So, Acanth no, Ichthyostegger. That is probably the one. There. And then what we got? Greer Piton? That might be one yeah. of them bad boys. I love a good Dimetrodon. Oh, they've even got the, uh, like the tips of the neural spines yeah. exposed a bit. That's cool. Because they find them like kind of twisted sometimes. I think it might have been a reduced sale. Oh, those dogs. <laughs> Is that a... Uh, Ariops, I think it says. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Temnus Bondle. Mm. Although it was a lot bigger than that. Yeah. Oh. oh, I think I've seen this uh, model, like photos of it before. So what's that? I mean, that's meant to be Tyrannosaurus, obviously. Carcass. What do you think that's going to be? Uh, baby Little... Tyrannosaur. Cannibalism. <laughs> Either that or a small Dromaeosaur. That's really cool, the anatomy. You can see like the yeah. scapula and stuff there. Oh, and you've got a gastralia. Oh, yeah. That's creepy. It's creepy. Yeah. It's, it's very morbid, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty awesome though. That's definitely how they always find them, isn't it? Yeah. Perfectly articulated. So Dave, do you find them like this in the Ken Ken? No, this is how we find them. Yeah. <laughs> or, you just or, come or, to or, the you <laughs> find it. We always find a wheelbarrow and a sugar. <laughs> no, we don't find anything articulated. <laughs> the, the, the spinosaur that we're doing is associated and that is a real one-off. Let's time travel to the Triassic. We might get Herarosaurus. We better. That's Herarosaurus. Oh, he's up there. <laughs> oh, is that what? Celophysis over there, see? Blattosaurus. He looks like a turkey. <laughs> well, Six for turkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a tiny strophus uh, down here. Whoa. So cute. So blue. Was it not underwater? He's in love with it. Come out of the dragons, really, aren't you? You take that back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That <laughs> didn't work. Did it not work? 
Oh, he didn't, he didn't that is a nice Diplodocus. Whoa, knocked the tree down. Accurate Cloaca as well. This is my favourite of the models. I like this. That is one big pile of stinky. Woo. That's really cute. The little Archaeopteryx. Eddie for scale. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> You're close. You're close. <laughs> oh, Nilly. Yeah, you got it. I think I see a Spinosaurus through the trees. You know Nizar is going to be so excited. He's probably still there. I mean, definitely outdated now, but that is quite a nice model. Oh, Deinonychus is meant to be. Probably not enough feathering and a bit of shrink wrapping, but... Oh, and pronated arms. That, that doesn't help. It's got circular pupils though. That's nice. Crocodile. Oh, is, wait, is that meant to be Goniophilus? Hamza is probably here for a bit. But I am more excited about my favourite dinosaur. Oh! Dab him up then. Oh! Dab him up. Oh, he's gorgeous. <laughs> I love Therizinosaurus so That's much. Really Dab him up. <laughs> I want. I'm going to be swiped away like a deer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so we still only have like arm material, well, not very much material of Therizinosaurus, but we know it's massive and what, like meter long claws, mm. plus the extensions of the keratin sheaths over them. Oh, except now, supposedly, um, Therizinosaurus couldn't use their claws for anything. They would, <laughs> apparently, according to a new paper, just display, display features because uh, they structurally failed under all these different, uh, different activities they tested, like digging and um, bringing food down, yeah, scratching and things. So, just have these big useless claws, which you can see right there. It's a really nice model. Hello, I like your feathers. And the arms in the right orientation. Yeah. Why has it got British flag colours on its arms? Could be, yeah. Oh my god, it's the boneheads. But should they be hitting their heads or kicking with their legs? I don't think it's difficult to guess what this is. <laughs> nice ornamentation above the orbits. Pronated hands though. Interesting with the kind of almost osteoderm like things, the scutes, larger scales in the skin. Quite like the, the red patches under the throat as well. I think they had that in uh, Prehistoric Planet with the Tyrannosaurs displaying to each other. We're in the Cenozoic now. Oh no! We're after, uh, yeah, Eurohippus. And there's a Gaston is coming for it. Even though. They're actually had the wrist. They're no threat. It's fine. It's not chasing them. It's just chilling. But yeah, this uh, has fossils found in Messel, and then the North American diatrima is now uh, also synonymized with uh, Gastornis. And it's on the lineage that includes ducks, so it is basically a big duck. You think you could take it? Yeah. That is amazing. I've never seen an Andrew Sarkis like life reconstruction like this. That is amazing. Paraceratherium. Bloody big, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Under the Paraceratherium. Platybelodon. Wait, the bed in the tea <laughs> You should lie across its jaws. Yeah, someone can add either thing. <laughs> can I? Wait, should I stick my head in the jaw? <laughs> After having a lot of fun exploring the dinosaur park and doing some very serious paleontology, we then headed into the main gallery of the museum, and immediately our minds were blown by the unbelievable things they have on display here, especially the full-scale casts of the giant Ashdarka pterosaurs, which gave us a tremendous sense of just how terrifying these creatures must have been to see alive. So we're now here in Dinosauria Museum Altmutal in Bavaria, uh, it is an absolutely incredible museum <laughs> with a very good gift shop. Um, and not only is there that 
great dinosaur park that you saw outside, but there's this museum space which is just extraordinary. I mean, the things they have in here, unbelievable. Mounted uh, full-edged darkid skeleton back there, but here we have Little Owl. Uh, it's the youngest Allosaurus specimen known, and it is in such a beautiful mount, just kind of in the center of the room. You can see how uh, like the crests above the eyes aren't as developed, and there's not as much uh, kind of keratinization around um, the top of the skull. And yeah, I mean, it's just a stunning specimen. Little Owl has not yet been scientifically published, and so it was a real treat to see this incredible specimen here. Hopefully, future research on the specimen will be able to tell us a lot more about the early life of these iconic dinosaurs. The museum also houses some absolutely stunning fossils of Jurassic marine crocodilomorphs that tell us a lot about how these reptiles reproduced. Um. I will say this really honestly, I do not know what croc this is. It is a metrorhynchid, because if you look at the top of the skull, where the eye should be, there is no post-orbital bar. It's a V-shape um, divot. So the eyes will slot in there, you've got the massive supertemporal fenestra, you've got the reduced limbs, the reduced forelimbs, elongated high limbs. But what's amazing is that the metrorhynchids, they, they practically like ichthyosaurs in a way. They reduce their limbs so much to become paddles. I don't know what this is, but there was an I we got a talk by the um, tour guide here, and he said that there's a possibility that this could be a viviparous animal, because uh, we have a juvenile metrorhynchid right here. So this is definitely Dacosaurus. Yes. And then, yeah, he said it, it has like no forelimbs, pretty much. I mean, they're very reduced if they are there. So it, he's saying, explaining how that um, supports the idea of like birth in the water and not being, you know, uh, starting off life on land and going into the water because how is it moving around without any falling? <laughs> yeah. Metrorhynchids are likely ovo, ovo viviparous. Yes. <laughs> uh, which is where like the eggs hatch inside the mother's body and then they come out um, like once they've hatched. So that's likely what was happening in, um, yeah. in these animals. Sorry, I just noticed signs. Yeah, Mama Dacosaurus, they say, because of this specimen. It is Dacosaurus. But one thing we have to notice straight away is the sheer size of it. Yeah, it is. A five meter long, they said, Dacosaur, which is incredible. But um, yes, what, Mama. <laughs> so we've also been told about this incredible turtle specimen. <laughs> the first thing you probably notice is the, the mandible, the lower jaw here, which is very, very hooked. And it looks really strange. You don't really see anything that extreme in um, modern turtles or tortoises. So we've been told again that there's, they actually don't know what this was being used for. The function, the exact function is uh, unknown. There's some ideas that maybe it was like using it to sort of probe around in the mud, but yeah, they're not entirely sure. It also apparently is a uh, quite shallow water species. So it's not adapted for a pelagic lifestyle out in the open ocean. Would have kind of inhabited the reefs as this really lovely paleo art uh, shows. So you can see the, the turtle down there with its hooked mandible swimming around in the reefs. I mean, yeah, just a stunning specimen really. So this is a currently unnamed kind of pterosaur and apparently it's sort of missing link in pterosaur evolution. So the, the signs explain and we've been told that it, it shows features in the skull that are quite like um, more derived pterosaurs. Uh, things like, you know, eventually to Pteranodon, Ashdarkids, all of that. And then parts of the body actually have features that are more similar to more basal ones, like the long-tailed Ramphorhynchoids um, and that sort of thing. So this is, that's, I mean, that's incredible. That's like kind of a, a, a key point in Terrace Revolution that this is showing. And uh, yeah, they say hopefully that will be uh, described quite soon. Going from very small pterosaurs to the largest that ever lived, the casts of the huge Ashdarkid pterosaurs were fantastic to see, and are based on a very interesting specimen that might potentially represent the biggest flying animal ever. Uh, so I'm here with Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, and uh, behind us is a specimen of Ashdarkid called Dracula. So I thought you could tell us a little bit about this specimen. Where did it come from and what do you think it might be? Yeah, so there are only a few tantalizing clues we have for giant yeah. dark right? The best one is, of course, the Texas giant, mm. Quetzalcoatlus, right? Everything's bigger in Texas, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but then we have bits and pieces from places like Spain. There's something called the oh, okay. La Solana giant, which is only known from a few neck bones. Oh, wow. Um, there's some big uh, uh, bones from, from uh, Jordan. Mm. And then there's Romania. And this is based on material that was found in Romania. 
and it's from Transylvania. So yeah. what's the first thing you think about when you hear Transylvania? <laughs> Vampires. Vampires, right? Yeah. So it's nicknamed Dracula. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, announced to the world as, as the largest terrorist or ever, um, even bigger than Quetzalcoatl. Mm. And so what you see here is, you know, um, based on um, different kinds of large pterosaurs. The material is relatively limited, but it's very, very big, yeah. right? So um, there's a neck bone of held the original. Oh, cool. It's absolutely enormous, <laughs> right? Um, there are bits of the wrist, again, yeah. off the scale. And so we recently did some work to um, put together a more precise, more accurate reconstruction of this giant yeah. dark hit. Um, Dracula, essentially. Yeah. We think that it's probably a, a pterosaur called Hatsigopteryx, right. which yeah. is known from Romania. There's just no overlap in the material, right? So the question okay. is, you know, whether two giant pterosaurs, right? Or, or yeah. Um, but it might well be Hatsigopteryx. And so what we did is we looked at the material that has been published for Quetzalcoatl mm. and um, other larger dark pterosaurs, and we pieced together what is really the first scientifically accurate representation of a giant ice dark, at least based on what we know yes. um, today. And so it comes out at, you know, 11.4 meters in wingspan, roughly. Oh, wow. So this is a really, really big animal. And yeah. it, it just blows your mind, right? Because, it's, um, you know, if you're standing in front of this thing, you can't help but just imagine what this yeah. would have looked like in the flesh and, you know. So have you, have you ever seen a, a giant of dark reconstruction of, <laughs> I haven't, of that sort? I haven't seen one where it's actually on the ground. Yeah. And I, I've always wanted to. Because I feel like when when up in the air yeah, like that, like they they look impressive, but having it like right in front of you like this, you can really get a sense of the scale. Yes. So this is really impressive to see. Yeah. And as if coming face to face with a giant Ashdarkid wasn't enough, the staff at the museum also allowed us to get up close and personal with their T-Rex specimen, a 10 meter long subadult named Rocky, who was about 16 years old at the time of death and was unearthed in South Dakota. Make sure I don't hit it as well. Cool. All fine? Yeah. <laughs> the first this is step crazy. Drive to that. <laughs> wow. Okay, so this is a once a lifetime opportunity to get right up to a skull of a tyrannosaur at this height. And as you can see, so this is Rocky, a uh, sub adult, it's not fully grown. And if you look at um, sort of the orbit region, uh, it's less rugose and less cratinized, although there is still some wrinkling, as it still would have been some hormonates there. You can see the teeth. And I had a quick rough count earlier, and um, there's around this 15, which is a bit more than adult tyrannosaurs at around 12, but it's less than the uh, su supposed nanotyrannosaurs at about 18. <laughs> there's been them there. Um, yes, yeah, so here's the teeth, and you can see out the front, those D-shaped teeth would have been good for cutting off small chunks of flesh from the bone. Wow, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm just doing getting close yeah, as well. Do. Don't want to hog it myself. Should we take photos? Yeah, we can go higher. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Literally taller than a T-Rex right now. Say stop, yeah? Yeah, if you want to. Wow. wow. So you can see the... Look down. Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, we, we can go right. We can go a little bit higher. Get yeah, a good look of those. Super temporal finestra. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's a view you don't normally get. The uh, top of a Tyrannosaur skull. You can see um, sort of how deep those uh, fossa are of the supratemporal fenestra for housing those muscles. Even though it's a subadult, it's still a very large specimen. This is what a brontosaur must feel like. Or an Alamosaurus if we're going contemporary. How much of it is um, uh, original, like bone? No, 50%. 50%, okay. That's a good percentage. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
<laughs> a little bumper. Let's get some paint for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, a bit close, sort of level with the skull. Yeah, can we be level? level? Yeah. yeah, level with the skull. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's below. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so? Yes. Yes, that's great, thank you. Ready. Yeah. Do you want your head in? Hmm? Okay. Oh, what into Here you can see. It's okay for you. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, no. Hamza, do you want to get in there? Go on, Hamza. I've been up too much. Okay, now put it inside. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the first time you've done that, is it? No. You're in danger. You're in danger. You're in danger. <laughs> Give it. <laughs> Look to me. Your, your, head is, yes. your hair was literally touching the oh teeth. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. So T-Rex. T-Rex. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. Great. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, I mean, I could spend all day up there. Yes. But. It's your head and his head. Lay down. Further down. Yes, and put your head in the back. It's too much. Like that? Okay. <laughs> you don't often get a view like that. Really good view of the supratemporal fenestry and the fused nasals. One of the diagnostic features. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Wow. <laughs> that was so cool. So you've just pointed out that there are some pretty. Uh, Nasty breaks. Yeah. The, uh, the ribs there. So you've got horrific pathologies. Two on that rib there. <laughs> one yeah. there, one there. So. so you, yeah, so you can see the lumps kind of on the ribs. And that's where they've broken and rehealed. So it's all this reactive yeah. bone deposition. There's a little break on the other side as well. There is, yeah. there's a callus. Yeah. Right oh, yeah. On the side. Yeah. Uh, see that through that? Yeah, you can. Just about between those two ribs there. And we've seen that in um, some allosaurus specimens as well. Considering they're mostly on the one side, maybe it was a fall or yeah. something like that. Or like, yeah, collision with something, obviously. Yeah. That's really interesting. Be cool to get some uh, thin sections yeah. through there. But obviously it survived this, I mean. Yeah, obviously it's healed, so that's yeah, not what killed it. No. But then there's always the chance of like resulting infections and things. It's just, it's amazing, like, this is a sub but how robust it is still. Like, yeah. It's probably like under 20, but like, you think what Jane yeah. is around 13, 14. Mm. This is probably what, maybe three to five years older? I think, yeah, they said uh, about 16. So. Yeah. so is that actually, that is one of the bite marks that you can see on the... Yes, on that side. Let me just try and get a good angle of that. There's a huge hole. So you can kind of see and right in the middle any, there. I wonder if there's any remodeling, whether those... Yeah, there might be. I mean, there must be if it's... Um, yeah, don't feel like that. But you can see the holes in the very back of the lower jaw. They are, well, they are from biting from another tyrannosaur. Presumably, that's what yeah. new research has suggested. Which shows, like, even as sub-adults or like younger individuals, they were still yeah, biting. still biting. Uh, whether that's play or something else. Yeah, I mean, it could even be an indicator of like sexual maturity if if it is a yeah. um, you know competing for dominance sort of thing. Oh yeah. Really cool. I, th I think they are sexually mature at this point. Yeah, yeah. At this size, you'd expect so. But yeah. Such an impressive specimen. Well, that was an unbelievably cool experience. And thank you again to the staff of the museum for letting us go eye level with a T-Rex. It was a truly unforgettable day. This museum is just filled with paleontological treasures, and we had such a fantastic time here. I'd highly recommend visiting if you're ever in the area. The next day was our last full day in Germany before our journey home began, and we were headed to the city of Stuttgart, where another amazing natural history museum can be found. I'm here in the Stuttgart Museum. We've been let behind the scenes, that incredible collection of marine reptiles and fish. They've got so much here, so many ichthyosaurs. It really is just ichthyosaur heaven, and plesiosaurs, thalatosuchians. It's mostly Posidonia specimens. There are some Solnhofen ones, and there's one from Yorkshire. Uh, they've even got Sueva Leviathan holotype here, um, Temnodontosaurus. It just is a mind-blowing collection. We're so lucky to be given this behind-the-scenes look uh, at one of the world, like, greatest collections in the world, honestly, um, of these animals. So many stenopterygious specimens, uh, preserving embryos, preserving different examples of how, how they died and were preserved. 
um, you can see examples where the entire sclerotic ring has kind of popped out of the orbit, showing that like the eye must have come out and <laughs> as they died. And yeah, evidence of kind of uh, reefs building on the bodies, kind of like whale falls today. When they die, they you know become a, an environment for scavengers and things to uh, to live on. And the same sort of thing was happening all these millions of years ago with these ichthyosaurs and other animals. Um, and yeah, we're just so lucky to be <laughs> allowed to have this behind the scenes look at this incredible collection. So this is an absolutely stunning specimen of Uranosaurus spa. Uh, that's all it is labeled. Obviously the uh, famous long snout, kind of like a swordfish, where the lower jaw stops uh, short of the upper jaw and it extends on much further. But we were just um, kind of stunned by this specimen for the enormity of the forelimbs. Um, there are ideas that certain ichthyosaurs that have uh, very large um, forelimbs still, because obviously that's not their main use of, uh, main mode of propulsion. They're using their tails to propel themselves. But it has been proposed that some uh, ichthyosaur forelimbs are like still possibly being used for low velocity propulsion. Um, could also be like you see in um, modern uh, humpback whales, where they've got ridiculously long pectoral fins in relation to other cetaceans, um, you know, using them for display and all of that, maybe slapping the water's surface or something. Um, obviously, you can hypothesize a lot about what these ichthyosaurs were using them for, but yeah, just I don't think I've seen a Uranosaurus that has that long of a pectoral fin, and you can even see some soft tissue preservation, like it, the bones end about here, and then the soft tissue continues on for a bit, so. A very long finned animal. I like it, this is. So here's just a really nice example of a stenopterygius individual. Um, and you can actually see on the bones here, on the vertebrae, uh, on the ribs, there's traces of ammonites. Um, and actually I've just noticed as well, there's some traces of encrusting bivalves in one of the, the hind limbs and on the vertebrae as well. So this shows how this specimen, when it died, uh, the body was actually exposed on the sea floor for a period of time. And then, you know, you don't really see much encrusting around the head. So that does sort of indicate how, you know, it went in head first, um, anterior region of the animal got buried very quickly, um, probably went straight through the substrate. And then uh, the back part was exposed on the surface for a bit. And this allowed other organisms, other invertebrates to kind of encrust on it and colonize it. I mean, the ammonites, they just kind of fall on top. But yeah, it's really cool, you know, showing uh, the taphonomy of this animal, how it decayed and, uh, how it, you know, other invertebrates interacted in the same environment as this wonderful ichthyosaur. Another of the ichthyosaurs they have here is a very rare type called Suevo Leviathan, which I had been very excited about seeing. So I'm here with the holotype of Suevo Leviathan disintegrator. This is the species that was found in the 1920s. It's a really breathtaking specimen, honestly. You've got the entire body here, um, you've got the quite large elongate forelimbs and the relatively uh, long uh, hind limbs. You've got the tail at the other end. You can see it kind of ends in sort of a, a spiral structure. Now there's an idea that they were actually using, or oh, the reason for this kind of spiral um, of the, the caudal fin there is that the fins themselves, the lower um, lobe of the caudal fin was quite flexible. And so it's possible that that's why it was able to, you know, stretch around like that. It's still all in sequence, all the vertebrae. So it's possible that, you know, uh, the soft tissue is still there and it was just quite flexible when it uh, died and kind of curled back on itself. Um, or it could just be, you know, as it was decaying, it became more flexible. Um, but there's some quite nice paleo art actually of uh, Suevo Leviathan specifically kind of using its caudal fin as a display structure, which I just, I like that idea. So two species of Suevo Leviathan were actually named. One of them was named in the 1840s and that's uh, Suevo Leviathan integer and one of them was named in the 1920s, Suevo Leviathan disintegrator. They were initially named as a different genus, but then in 1998, they were named as the new genus Suevo Leviathan. Uh, this means Swabian Leviathan, obviously it's in the name, but uh, this is after the region of Germany and Southwest Germany where it was discovered. So that's a really nice um, kind of, you know, homage to, uh, to the place where it was found and sounds really cool too. Then in 2018, the holotype of Suevo Leviathan integer, so the first one uh, that was found, um, it was, it had been considered lost for a really long time, uh, but it was actually relocated. And then based on new analysis of this specimen, plus uh, comparing it to this integer, it was thought that actually um, they're not different species. 
they might be just growth stages of each other. So this integer, uh, this is an example of this integer, uh, were thought to be older growth stages of Swerve Leviathan integer uh, because they're generally larger, they have larger, larger proportions and there's more ossification, so like bony uh, growth of the uh, proximal forelimbs, so the bits around here of the forelimbs. So now it's thought that Swerve Leviathan integer is probably the only valid species and this integer is not valid, but there's been some disagreement over that. But for now, yeah, it might only be one species, Swavo Leviathan integer. So Swavo Leviathan is a very interesting ichthyosaur, with fossils of these strangely proportioned animals being very rarely found in the Posidonia Shale compared to others such as Temnodontosaurus. And it's interesting to think about what their possible ecology and lifestyle might have been like. Seeing the vast collection of ichthyosaurs and other marine reptile fossils at Stuttgart was another incredible experience, and we again felt very fortunate to have been let loose behind the scenes, especially in a place like this, which is pretty much an ichthyosaur lover's heaven. But that brings us to the end of our paleontological adventures in Germany. The next day we drove onward to France, and had a lot of field work to finish writing up while on the coach. There's Eddie hard at work on his, such a good student. Then, after a night spent in Reims, we returned to the UK. Our trip to Germany was so much fun, and seeing so many important paleontological sites and museums here gave us a new appreciation for the significance of the country's prehistoric heritage. If you ever get the chance to visit, I can highly recommend all of the places that we featured in these videos. And that's not even all of Germany's paleontological treasures. I've still not been to the Berlin Natural History Museum, though I hope to one day soon. I really hope you've enjoyed watching the Boneheads crew on this adventure, it would be really fun to do more travelling episodes like this in the future. So let us know in the comments your ideas for where we could go next. Also again apologies to all the German speakers for our pronunciations of your names, I hope it wasn't too bad. Anyway, thank you all for watching. <laughs>